Um, so these are our field notes of flow. Okay, so these are our experience of, from the last few years of kind of working in organizations trying to apply these kind of concepts. Um, and we know we should stop using Twitter as well. We will eventually stop. Um, I think the first thing to call out is probably we made it. Well, how do you know when Teams Apologies has become mainstream? It's in safe. Come on, everyone. <laughs> We've done it. <clears throat> We're in there with uh, animal sacrifice driven development. That's in there. 6.2. And uh, Elon Musk chaos months, which it's ongoing. <laughs> Hopefully, he's going to end it at some point. It's going to be out of control now. Um, but I guess all teasing aside, like you can tell when something's become mainstream when people start adopting it for their own uh, means. Um, so I guess what is it going to give us as well, like Team Topology as well? I think it's given us probably the deadliest drinking game in human history, which is the Agile Conference, <laughs> Conway's Law, Bingo. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's, a few people can still walk by the end of an Agile conference keynote. I mean, we lost a lot of good Agile delivery people at Agile Cambridge. It's <laughs> chaos. Um, and I, I guess the other thing I wanted to mention is that like, Mel Conway is like, the best person on Twitter, and he's, he's, he's alive as well. Like, no, right, he's alive. Um, but he kind of explains about communication paths, and he does it in a way that makes so much sense. And he isn't talking about software a lot of the time. He's talking about language. He's talking about the Apollo moon landing and how, you know, how they managed to get people onto the moon because of the way they arranged teams. You've not lived if you've not had Mel Conway telling you off. Like, I can't find the tweet, but I got something wrong, and he just leaned into the conversation and just explained it to me. It's like, great. Excellent. But definitely follow Mel Conway. He does a lot. And he talks about politics as well and the evolution of language. And yeah, it's really interesting how he kind of communicates this stuff. Um, but for us, our story, um, it starts in 2019. So at the time, I was working at Foot Asylum. Uh, Tolly was working at Cinch. Um, and we were just starting to think about teams and platforms. And like it, it just happened at the right time that the book was coming out as we were starting to think about these things. But we didn't really have the word for it. Um, and then we started hearing people talking about like stream-aligned teams and platform teams. Like, there's someone in the organization who, who likes this as well. This is great. We're not alone. And there's this kind of socio-technical kind of movement that happened. And then meetups and conferences started to reference it as well. And naturally, when these people are kind of around, you want to be the best friend because you're like, oh, they care about it as well. And you, you, know, you accidentally become these value stream architects with these people in the organization because they've read the book. OK, they get it. Um, so we became the kind of accidental team topologist practitioners and started, people started inviting us to all sorts of weird and wonderful meetings because it's like, oh, we, you know about team stuff a little bit. So it's like, great, cool, we're involved. Um, so this is the story, OK? We took the concepts from the book. Uh, I was working at Foot Asylum and then moved to Cinch. Tolly was at Cinch. And we became accidental practitioners. So here we are, OK? So my name's Andy. I'm a senior software engineer, um, senior software engineer manager at Prolific, and Tolly who's on a career break at the minute, so he's, he's, he, he, we're here. Um, and these are our feared notes of flow. Um, so what did we find out? So applying like four years down the line, what have we really learned? Well, there's kind of three things we want to talk about today. Like the first one is that teams need to be information radiators. We'll explain what we mean by that. Um, that teams, like the gaps are going to emerge, like that need fixing. You have to be really intentional as well. And it's surprising how many people kind of don't want to be intentional about this stuff. I don't get the reasoning behind making sure you're kind of over optimized on some parts of this. Um, and that team topologies kind of influences things that we didn't expect, uh, like recruitment, ways of working, and things like that. And we'll go into that later on. Uh, but first of all, we we'll to talk a little bit about the teams being kind of information radiators and what that means. I mean, it seems obvious, right? It's called team topologies for a reason. It's, um, it does have to be said, it needs to be a team first approach, OK? You've got to align teams to, to a value stream, to, to, to something that's moving from left to right where there's a flow of value. Um, and then the team needs to have this kind of this bounded autonomy. We want autonomy, but they need to have constraints around them. These teams need to understand the rules of the game. And then they need to be open about the value that the teams are adding and outwardly communicate this, which is something that doesn't always happen. So for us, like, it has to be a team first culture to be effective at team topology, kind of uh, applying those kind of concepts to your organization. And we think the team really needs to be the unit of delivery. This is from like the GDS kind of blog from about five, 10 years ago. But the team has to have all the capabilities in it to be able to deliver, right? It's not about individual tickets, of, uh, you know, individual people being assigned individual tickets on JIRA. It's a group working together around constraints, aligned to part of the value stream, and they've got the, con the conditions exist within that team for them to be able to deliver value. Because we don't want to be in this situation where you've got the devs, 
who are the team. And then you've got the DevOps people who sit outside of the team. You've got UX people. You maybe got a product manager you can speak to every now and again. Or maybe there's a the CX team that you, you spoke to them once when you first joined, but you've no idea what's happening there. You know, you need to bring people into the team so you haven't got these external handoffs, which is what Matthew talked about in the keynote. Um, we kind of want as many capabilities within the team because you need these, this range of experience, right? Because otherwise, we've got individuals going off in different directions. We maybe have a team that owns the front end, another team owns the back end. Um, or you get these teams that have these kind of internal functional silos. So we want to we have everything in the team that's needed to deliver the work. The team has to be the unit of delivery. And then we're kind of aligned to a value stream, right? And that's aligning to a problem space. We're aligning teams, like people, <laughs> to the real world where there's, there's problems, there's constraints, where rules exist, where stakeholders live. You know, we want teams to understand the teams around them, who's upstream, who's downstream. We want people to be able to manipulate the part of the value stream. If it's a team that's working around loyalty, what can they do within loyalty to manipulate and understand the constraints and experiment? And again, we want to we want to kind of stop handoffs. And, and again, there's a difference between like no handoffs and non-blocking communication. We'll explain a little bit about what I mean. But what, I guess what we're trying to get to is the fact that um, you've got the you may, may people. I think maybe a few people in this room have seen the um, the. Uh, team Topology Academy course by Nick Tune and Casper Gunia. They talk about the development value stream that enables building the solution space, right? So this isn't th this is how well, the steps that have to happen for people to build something. Okay. Um, and we don't really talk about this bit on the right hand side that much, like supporting, like analytics, like incidents. You've got to support this stuff as well. The team has to be able to own it, deliver it, support it. All this has to fit within that team. But if the value isn't visible, if, if the development value stream here isn't visible, then we kind of get this a wholly fictional example of what might happen, OK, at an organization where you've got the CEO. And he messages, you know, you get that message, hello, on Twitter, oh, sorry, on Teams or Slack. Quick question, two hours later, who are all these people and what are they working on? Because we've got 20 teams now, we've got 200 people, and he's trying to do budgeting. And then, I need metrics. Who are all these people? I want to measure everybody. We need to measure everything now. Uh, can we not get some 10x developers and assign some work to them? My mate Elon just got rid of loads of people, and they're working fine, right? Everything's working great over there. And then the classic one is, uh, how can we make sure we're using 100% of our engineers? And this is because communication isn't happening. Okay. And then the only thing you can do is get a new phone or <laughs> a new job, whichever one happens. And the reason for this is because, like, Streamlined teams tend to forget to radiate information. They kind of get stuck in this black hole of, of product work, right? Um, and we, we do it on purpose, in a way. We kind of have streamlined teams that are the silos. Right? We, we put them in these functional kind of almost, not functional silos, but we kind of split up the value stream into, you know, they've got the vertical slice. They don't really care too much about what's going on, and we're quite happy with that. And we kind of over-index a little bit. I think that's probably the problem, because each team is hyper-optimized for its own Thing it's trying to do. It's got no incentive really to help the other teams outside of their scope. If the, what they're being measured on is the success of their part of the value stream, why would they care about what's going on outside of that? And then teams kind of drift away from each other over time. We see this happen quite a bit, where teams forget what's happening across the organization. But there's things we can do, and that's what we're trying to get to in this talk. Um, I don't, anyone familiar with the Team Onion by Emily Weber? Cool, a couple of people. Um, it's a really effective way of understanding who needs to be around the team. You've got the core people in the team, or the core people that are going to deliver the software, deliver the service. You've got the collaborators. But ultimately, what we want to get to is each team understanding who are the supporters, who are the people they need to radiate information to. Because if they don't, you're going to get the CEO messaging you, hello, dot, 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 and then not replying for an hour. You get all these types of problems. So ultimately, this first bit I'm trying to talk about is about working in the open and why it's so important, why working in the open can resolve quite a lot of these problems. Because um, your team type kind of dictates your openness. People kind of want to know what streamlined teams are up to because that's the part where the customer sees. You know, the, the, we, we talk to customers a lot and we're, we're moving very fast. But for the other team types, it's a little bit more difficult, like enabling teams and working groups, um, the complicated subsystem team, you know, the platform teams. It, it's not that easy to see what they're working on at a point in time. So we need to kind of work a little bit more transparently. We need to work in the open. And for us, that means that teams pick, uh, can pick up passing information through things like internal blogs. Um, they share knowledge and experience. And can, teams can learn from each other and work more effectively, things like checkpoints and, and things like that and assessments. 
Um, and we also help teams to understand their role in the organization, the value stream they contribute to, their interactions with other teams. We need to make all of this open, because otherwise we get these hyper-optimized teams that don't speak to each other at all. Um, and we kind of really need to be con um, intentional about creating these non-blocking communication paths that, in that inform, that elevate good practice. You've kind of got to connect the dots a little bit across the organization to create knowledge networks. Um, you kind of have to be Pac-Man. It's looked a little bit like Pac-Man, so, so I put that in there. But you've got to, I mean, when you get into a senior position, you almost have to be the person that connects the dots across the organization. Um, and we think there's some really good ways of doing this. Something that we had a real success of at, um, at Cinch was around uh, communities of practice. And that's people across the organization who do the same job in different teams. When else do they get the time in a week to connect and get better at what they do together? Um, if, you, if you're interested in community practice, maybe it's something you bring into your organization. Uh, just get the book by Emil Weber. It's the easiest way to get into it. It tells you exactly how to set them up in your organization and what the steps are that you need to go through. And you want to forge these, inte uh, these intentional connections, okay? These communities of practice. We've seen communities of practice around um, observability, defining how we want to use something like Datadog, what login, what metrics, what span, <laughs> you know, what tracing, what all these things mean to us and how we can apply them in a way that's the same across the organization. Agile delivery community practice that work out how can we be more effective at delivering uh, services? You know, how can we get better at workshops and facilitating and have stand-ups that are actually useful? Things like that. Um, and kind of like an engineering community of practice where people who are engineers can come together to learn to get better at being engineers by learning from engineers on other teams that they wouldn't really get a chance to speak to. So community of practice is a really good way of connecting the dot across teams. And then team APIs are another brilliant way. You know, they're going to happen whether you want them to or not. Um, it's a naming convention, you know, and Team Topology has kind of given us that. Um, teams are going to create them in different guises. If you're not, like, if, if you don't just tell people to just use the template, like, get them to use the template. It's a solved problem. Um, teams will spend months kind of designing the format of team APIs. I've seen them in PowerPoint. I've seen them in Jira. I've seen them all over the place. Just use the one. Stop bike shedding. Just use the, use the example from GitHub because you know what people are like, right? <laughs> Someone's definitely going to end up doing it in PowerPoint, and we don't want that. Just use the sample because the team APIs are a brilliant way of connecting the dots to understand the teams around you and you, you, you know, the relationship over time and how, if that changes or not, there's probably some boundary issues and you need to look at those. Um, and we also use team APIs for our community of practice as well. Um, so this is the principal engineer, uh, principal and staff engineer community of practice. Um, they, it was, you know, people could see what they were talking about. Go on the Teams, go on the Miro board. It's just easy to see what they were working on. And then the last thing I want to talk about is about observability. So we want it to be open. Um, this is a dashboard, and this is one of the ones that we had, and it was about inviting people to look at dashboards in the organization to answer questions. And then one of the biggest successes um, was internal blogging, of all things. We've got everybody using internal blogging, and it meant that people became writers, and people across the organization could pick up on what was going on without there being these tight coupling between teams. OK, so we put all these things in practice, right? Things are starting to scale. Gaps are starting to emerge. And Tolly is going to explain what we do next. Thank you. Hello. Um, thanks, Andy. Um, so I guess. The first thing that we came, uh, when we, we sat down to write these notes of flow, after having worked um, with um, team topologies and optimizing fl for flow for about four years, is we agreed that, that these groups of people need to be, have a team first culture, and they need to um, really be good information radiators to be effective in their bounded autonomy. Um, otherwise, you find the problems that uh, Andy was talking about. But uh, if you think about what Team Topologies is, it's a, um, for your organization, is the structure of groups of people and the communication path between them and at any point in time. But as, um, as Matthew said earlier in the, in the keynote, it's a snapshot, right? And those snapshots, there's loads of those snapshots, and really, your organization is a dynamic system. You need to look at it as that. And you have to, you have to accept that things will uh, change and things will break, and you'll have to... Um, try and find those gaps and see where they are and try to bridge them. So the first gap that we found um, quite often, and hopefully a lot of you resonate with this, is that the rate of change, um, the rate of growth of software uh, outpaces the rate of growth of teams. And as we know, you can't continuously throw teams um, or people at software because one, it doesn't work, two, it's not um, effective financially. So. And the reason this happens is because in this model, we want everything to be owned. 
and um, we want everything that started to continue. We want to con we want to start new things. Uh, nothing really ends. So the key thing here is that you want to try and um, reduce the scope of the software where possible. Because if you don't do that, you get these streamlined teams that have uh, ownership of a domain, and that domain outgrows um, their you know their capacity to to deal with it. And um, you get high cognitive load. They do a lot of things poorly, and and that you know that that's definitely something that we've seen happen uh, quite a lot. And then that becomes quite um, explosive. It's it's not something that you can manage. And then the problem is that the business doesn't see this as a problem because they want an app instead. And your CPO might mention you and say, "Hi, three dots." And you're like, "Oh God, um, I want an app." And before you start saying, "Well," One second, we have all these problems with all these people having too much software, too much cognitive load. They've got an answer because they want to push the, the business forward, and they've they've got the, they've got this idea of an app team that they want to build. And then you're like, oh, but wait, we have to think about the team boundaries. How is this going to affect the team boundaries? All this stuff. And then they're like, don't please, please don't bring the team APIs back. I don't want to hear about these team APIs again. Um, and then because there are these visionaries, like, well, can we not? take payments and finance and just you know put them together and you know it's just it works right we can do this all right what's it, where it gets really really depressing because the app is not a problem it's it's a solution to a problem and then you start questioning are you committing to a problem space or are you committing to a solution space and the problem with that is that a solution space can be different depending on who you speak to so the first thing that we kind of noticed a few months down the line is that you want to try and keep your software growth in pace with your team's growth, because otherwise you, um, you get that cognitive load explosion, you get attrition, the business breaks ultimately. Um, so the next thing you want to think about is um, it, it, you have to accept that when you optimize for flow, it is harder to pivot, it's harder to change, in a way it's less agile. And the reason for that is because um, you're building two things into your system when you're, when you're taking this approach. You're building deep domain knowledge, and you're building ownership. And um, when you want to switch things around, where you have these lovely streamlined teams, you get a mess. And the further reason why you do that is because what, what have you done? You've applied an inverse Conway's law maneuver to try and, uh, try and get these search service and um, checkout service and infrastructure repo. Um, and you create these teams, but then once you've created these these, te these these teams, then those teams create these architectures, and those architectures architectures can't fundamentally change that easily. So you have to unpick it, but then you can guarantee that someone somehow will say, we need to do a massive reorg because reasons. And uh, you end up changing everything at once, it becomes a big bang change, and um, you get a mess out of it. You also hear this term called domain bashing. Has anyone heard this term before? Put your hand up. Some people. Um, you hear that a lot, actually, um, in where at Century we worked at, at least, um, because people want to say, well, why don't you kind of put these domains together? It should, should be fine, right? What can go wrong? And when we were thinking about this with Andrew, we were thinking, well, what, what is the key, the key takeaway from these things is that you need to be at ease um, with uncertainty and complex social technical systems. And unfortunately, you can't just organize endless town halls. You have to think, which is what Matthew, Matthew Skelton said earlier. And one approach to this is you can adopt an organizational strangler pattern, uh, but without strangling anyone, obviously, and um, because we're not Twitter. And <laughs> I really do hope there's no one uh, who's worked at Twitter here. Um, yeah, sorry for picking on you. So um, you have to get better at or, or incremental or, or design. OK, you can't always do it incrementally, but you have to get better at it. You can start from version 1.0, go to version 1.1, 1.1, add, add a team, and then in version 1.2, add a platform team or, or um, platform group grouping, um, and or merge two teams together, whichever approach you want to take. Don't do everything at once. Um, the next technique you can try to, uh, to do is, um, as Suzanne was saying earlier, is try a value chain. Um, it's as simple as um, anchor from a customer, give them a need, and then add all the components that depend on that need to, to satisfy it. it sounds simpler than, than I say. It's easier said than done. But 
from that point on, you're a lot closer to worldly maps, a lot closer to domain driven design, and a lot closer to uh, team topologies. But you start from these simple techniques. And the good, the good thing about this, the, the value chain is that you can get a lot of different people with different roles in the same room to do these. It's not only about developers. And interestingly, developers try and map architectures more than they try to map value chains usually. So it's good to be cross-functional. The next low threshold for entry is event storming. So I can guarantee that you have a DDD expert in your company. That DDD expert will breed other DDD experts. And um, if, you get, if you start with a big room, a big, a big session, then other localized sessions will happen because it's a really useful, magical moment when someone says, oh, that's what you mean by X. I thought you meant Y. And that's, that's, that's what you want to get to, the language bit that Matthew was saying earlier. And that's, that's it about the gaps. Um, the next thing Andy mentioned is that we, in retrospect, it's interesting to see what team topologies has influenced in the company. And that's things like uh, architecture, ways of working, engineering practices, and even recruitment, which is probably the most surprising, but the most useful, I'd say. So first, the first thing is architecture. So again, architecting your system becomes a case of architecting your teams. Your architects, your principal engineers, your head of engineering are actually thinking about teams rather than our, um, software systems, because they use this inverse Conway's law maneuver. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that with team topologies, um, it enables good practice around EDA and micro microservice first approaches, at least in our context. And the reason, I think the reason for this is because the boundaries are clear and you can use a broker between uh, the teams and you can use business events and you can almost guess what those events are. And it becomes a lot simpler. The next thing is that there, are, there is some sorts of coupling that is actually, you can't really refuse them uh, because you might have a situation where, for example, you, uh, the order team and the loyalty team have to collaborate quite closely because uh, the loyalty team wants to respond to an, to an order. And after they've collaborated for a while, they figured out, okay, you can, just, um, you can just publish an event called order placed and have the particular attributes that I want on them. And then from then on, it's as a service. And that's, that's definitely something that if you're explicit with is really, really helpful because it allows the teams to innovate, but then it allows them to actually decouple and and um, move with flow. The next thing that I think is very interesting is platform, so or platform grouping. If you take the, um, the approach of build it, ship it, support it, you want your teams to learn how to do some things. You have to be brutal. You can't give them answers. They need to figure out their own things, their pipelines, their observability, their CICD, all this stuff. But you can get rid of all the other stuff, which is the GitHubs, the AWS accounts, all the management of those services. Um, Second thing is ways of working. So documentation is a big thing. It is encouraged, but it's hard to incentivize if you're not a platform or enabling team. Often, I think Andy uh, alluded to earlier, often in streamlined teams, it is an afterthought to uh, build in documentation. Uh, whereas with an enabling teams and platform teams, it's a bit more straightforward for them because that's, that's how they, uh, they build knowledge and they uh, codify their knowledge. The next thing is that enabling teams happen more than you think. Um, whether they're principal engineers, whether they're architects, because someone has to set um, or help set at least the, 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 the principles and practices for um, your observability, your data dogs, or um, have to uh, build a blueprint or a template to help the streamline teams when they don't have time. And then this other thing, this interesting thing called working groups. Just, just a quick check. Who's, who's used the, wor the, wor the, word, the words working group in their company, wherever they worked? In, in loose term, loads of people. So um, we alluded to in the abstract that we have this fifth mysterious um, team type. It's not really a fifth team type, but this is the working groups that we referred to because you know, you know what these are. Um, you have them in any company. You know what they look like. You know what they smell like. It's about you don't have all the right people in the team to, uh, to solve a particular naughty problem. You have to bring them in from various different departments or teams and solve that problem. Uh, to solve that problem well in a short time period. And this is what they are. They're short-lived virtual teams around a problem. And once it's done, it's done. So you have to have clear uh, kill criteria. And you have to swarm and then evolve and expand. I think the interesting thing here, what we both noticed, is that working groups have an evolution to an extent. So you can go from working group to more um, permanent enabling team. 
or even a platform team. And that working group is almost a signal, perhaps, that you might need something more permanent. And um, that's something that you need to pay attention to. Third thing is engineering practices. Uh, in a streamlined team, they need to build, ship, and support their teams. They need to learn all these things. Otherwise, it's, you, you're, you're, you don't really have flow because you're depending on other teams. So they need to get better at this. Um, Documentation, kind of mentioned it already, but uh, you have to get really, really good at documentation. Team APIs, ADRs, event documentation. And teams do actually get better at it because they, um, they understand the value of decoupling through documentation. And obviously, they'll try uh, their best to automate things. Finally, recruitment. So the optimizing for flow using team topologies is part of the recruitment process. So you might you might want to uh, hire this 10x developer, but you, want, you actually want to hire someone who wants to be part of a team, wants to be part of a good generative team. Otherwise, you'll have problems. So that needs to be a principle when you recruit. The other thing is that you'll find that depending on um, where they are on the spectrum from pioneers to town planners, you might um, hire pioneers to, uh, to work in working groups or almost complex subsystem teams, but you want your settlers to be in streamlined teams and your town planners and, and your platform, platform work. And we also found ourselves incentivized behaviors about team types and interaction modes in our progression frameworks. Um, because uh, as, as Andrew was saying, the silos don't really um, encourage this, um, this collaborative uh, approach. So that's it. If, you, uh, if you're the kind of people who kind of want to just skip to the end of the book, this is all, this is our three kind of highlights of our uh, notes. Team needs to be, um, have to have a team first culture and need to be really, really good information radiators and need to be um, purposeful with that. Uh, gaps will emerge that need fixing. Be intentional about it. You'll be surprised how many people don't want to be intentional or don't want to think, but you have to try and get them to, um, to understand that just because you've applied team topologies or you're thinking in team topologies, that means that you're perfect and that's done. It's not a silver bullet. Uh, and finally, um, just the things that we went through, like architecture, ways of working, recruitment that um, Team Topologies has influenced. Because it's uh, popular, uh, we did try and explain to, to kind of explain value streams um, to our C level, but we got a response that didn't quite work in <laughs> version 3.5. So um, that's it. Thank you very much.